and as the creed says he comes to judge the quick and the dead the living and the dead god is our judge god holds us to judgment when we think about judgment it's usually a negative word for us this idea of judgment is something that really seems to be a disconnect from modern people you know uh, judge my who wants to go to court you know it's a world of litigation we who who wants to be there and uh, have lawyers arguing and uh, for many people, the very idea of going to court, uh, they can't sleep the night before or weeks before. Okay, We are terrified of judgment, most of us. So is this a downer in the creed? Not really. If we go back again to Scripture, and I think we always must to understand the creed because it's based on Scripture, we find that the idea of judgment is a positive idea. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are crying out to God, Oh God, when are you going to judge? meaning when are you going to stand up for us? In the ancient Hebrew world, if society was in a mess, the judge would come and take his seat and sort it out and say who was in the right and who was in the wrong and restore the community to healthy, wholesome, functional life instead of messy, dysfunctional life. And so everyone would, phew, that's all right. We're put back straight again. Now that's the sense of judgment which comes through into the New Testament as well. We have taken it as, you know, God is going to be cross with us, but it's really not like that. It's if somebody is going to come and clean up the mess. The question at that point is, are you part of the mess or are you part of the solution, if you like? Anyone who is a believer in the power of goodness should be very thankful that that is a judgment because without that, life would be such a mockery when we look at the things that are going on in this world, there are many of them so evil. This isn't about God being harsh or vindictive. Those in hell, if you like, are not punished by God. They punish themselves. Of course, what the cross re reveals to us is that God grieves over that, that God experiences that torment in God's own being, but never coerces us into restoration because a coerced restoration is not a loving union. So we're always free to say no, and in that saying no, in that turning of our back on God, in stepping off the edge of that spiritual reality, we experience in our lives the brokenness, the disintegration, the torment, the pain that is the consequence of not being in loving union with God. Christ's judgment is his love, and the standard by which he will judge us is, did we show love? that judgment is not something that is, you know, um, some kind of punitive retribution, but rather it is the, simply the revelation of our bentness in the presence of that which is perfectly straight. It is the revelation of our brokenness in the presence of that which is perfectly whole. So there will be a final spelling out of the meaning of the lives of all of us before Christ in his presence at the second coming. All of us will be seen in the light of Christ-likeness for which we were created. We were created to be like Jesus. We were created for Christ-likeness. When that perfect Christ-likeness becomes manifest, any unchristlike any unchrist likeness in us also becomes manifest. We have lots of questions as ordinary human beings about the justice of God in doing that. Any human judge sitting in a court of law can only make a decision on the basis of the evidence presented, and the evidence presented will often only be partial. You can only make assumptions about people's motives, and motives can be interpreted in different ways humanly but this God is the God who understands us through and through. The thing about the judgment that is such a comfort is God never gets it wrong. Everybody will agree with the rightness of the judgment when it happens. No one will say oh it was unfair on me or this and that happened. No, it will be acknowledged that God is all and in all and that his judgment is perfect and shall not the judge of, the, of all the world do right. Um, as was said back in the Old Testament. In our case, the judge is also our lawyer. We've got the best lawyer in the universe 
afraid of the judgment? No way. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that promise that there is no condemnation is one of the most uh, powerful sheet anchors of the Christian hope. That isn't to say that we can in any way be careless about the way in which we live now. The only way to know that we're not guilty is to have made Jesus Lord and to live under his lordship, uh, to exercise faith in him and to trust fully in him. The only thing that separates us from the love of God is our rejection of that love. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, we notice what Christ says to both of them. I was hungry and thirsty, and you gave me food and drink. Or you did not do that. I was a stranger, you took me into your house. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. This is the final criterion of judgment. Did we show practical, compassionate love to our fellow humans? Christ does not ask at the last judgment, how strictly did you fast? How many prostrations did you make in your prayer? He asks, did you feed the hungry? Did you care for the strangers? Did you look after the sick? So that is the final test of judgment. Now, when the well-taught Christian looks ahead to God putting the world to rights, the well-taught Christian will say, on the one hand, I am a sinner, I know myself to be a sinner, and so I deserve God's judgment, but because of Jesus and what he's done, there will be no condemnation, there will be judgment, the world will be put to rights and I will be put to rights, but that will be a healing, life-giving thing because it is the Jesus who knows me and loves me who is the judge and through whose death and resurrection I know that I can stand confident before God.